Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started if you can find a seat. Welcome to the Jewish Museum. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the manager of public programs here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's dialogue and discourse, Lazar Kidekel's Legacy. This program has been funded by an endowment from the Saul and Harriet M. Rothkopf Family Foundation. And we are grateful for Harriet, Rhoda, and Nolan's attendance tonight. Thank you again for your generous support of the museum's public programming. Tonight's event is held in conjunction with the exhibition Shagal Lazitsky Malevich, The Russian Avant-Garde in Vitebsk, 1918 to 1922, on view in our second floor galleries through January 6th. So if you didn't have a chance to visit the exhibition tonight, please come back and do so. This is also our last evening program for the fall, but if you'd like updates on everything we have coming up next season, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. We're going to begin tonight's program with a short film that was commissioned for the presentation of this exhibition at the Centre Pompidou. And we want to thank filmmaker Lacey Amatsko for creating this version for our use tonight. Following the film, Regina Kidekel will moderate a group discussion. Dr. Kidekel received her MA and PhD from the St. Petersburg Academy of Fine Arts and has experience as an art critic, curator, and expert on Russian 20th century art. In 1990, she assumed the position of art director of the Diaghilev Art Center, and in 1998, she founded the Russian American Cultural Center in New York, where she is the executive director. She has contributed to numerous exhibition catalogs and books, most recently, Trajectory of Suprematism and Floating Worlds and Future Cities, Lazar Kidekel, Suprematism and the Russian Avant-Garde. Dr. Kidekel has lectured at numerous institutions, including Columbia University, Bryn Mawr, Parsons, and the Cooper Hewitt Master's Program. And in, in November 2018, Dr. Kidekel opened the exhibition Lazar Kidekel Towards the History of the Russian Avant-Garde at the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. Daniel Liebeskind is an architect, artist, professor, and set designer. He received his degree in architecture from the Cooper Union of the Advancement for Science and Art and a postgraduate degree in the history and theory of architecture from the School of Comparative Studies at Essex University. Liebskin founded his architectural studio in 1989 and currently serves as its principal design architect. Among his influential museum commissions are the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the extension of the Denver Art Museum, the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, and the Royal Ontario Museum. His portfolio also includes several residential and large commercial uh, centers. Liebskin's work has been exhibited in major museums and galleries around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art and the Bauhaus Archives, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Centre Pompidou. Anne Maria Kokori is an associate researcher for scholarly initiatives at the Art Institute of Chicago and a visiting lecturer at the University of Chicago. Her research and teaching focuses on early 20th century European art with a special interest in Russian modernism. Her work has been supported by the Art Institute of Chicago, the Courtauld Institute of Art, the Getty Research Institute, and the Malevich Society in New York. Her research has appeared in journals and exhibition catalogs, including the Chagall Lizitsky Malevich and the Russian Avant-Garde exhibition, and the Tate Modern's 2014 exhibition, Kazimir Malevich. She is the author and co-editor of Utopia, Russian Art and Culture, 1900 to 1989, and is currently working on a new publication on Kazimir Malevich and the Unovis Group. Following the discussion, copies of Daniel Liebeskin and Dr. Kiedekel's books will be available for purchase and signing. And if I could ask you to please take a moment to silence your cell phones, we will begin the film. Thank you.
consacre une exposition d'envergure à l'école populaire d'art de Vitebsk. La raison principale, c'est la, la grande méconnaissance de ces chapitres clés de l'histoire des avant-gardes russes. Durant les quatre ans, Vitebsk se mue en un laboratoire révolutionnaire et, et public et ouvert pour un monde nouveau. Et ces lieux devint une sorte de cité de modèle où les valeurs bolcheviques, telles le collectivisme, telle la démocratisation des arts, sont portées à bout de bras par les artistes. Ce sont Chagall d'abord et Malevich ensuite avec son collectif Onovis qui sont à l'origine d'un projet social émancipateur. Et c'est en cela que cette aventure de l'école de populaire d'art peut nous intéresser aujourd'hui. Parce que cette école a été précurseur. Elle a vraiment elle a fait confiance aux artistes et elle a su mobiliser une intelligence collective. L'école de Vitebsk était, était certainement précurseur pour, euh, à cette idée de démocratisation de, de l'art qui permet de, de faire participer toute classe sociale, tout âge, toute religion, euh, toutes les cultures, et de faire bénéficier euh, cette expérience de l'art. Un phénomène aussi euh, riche et intense comme ce qui euh, survient à Vitebsk dans, entre 18 et 22 euh, n'arrive à euh, pas de zéro, jamais. Vitebsk est une ville qui a sa propre histoire d'art, euh, qui est liée aussi à son statut de ville juive. Euh, pendant l'Empire russe, les Juifs étaient confinés, n'avaient pas le droit de circuler en dehors d'un certain nombre de localités. Vitebsk en faisait partie. Euh, et euh, toutes les villes n'avaient pas d'école d'art, mais Vitebsk en avait une. Les citoyens de religion juive euh, étaient contraints à devenir des Luftmenschen, euh, c'est-à-dire s'extraire se, euh, ou devenir des, des Juifs errants pour changer de, euh, de toit, de région, de ciel, de terre. C'est intéressant d'ailleurs de voir à quel point une, une situation euh, sociologiquement tragique devient une image de rêve. Le phénomène que représente Vitebsk vient du fait que, euh, à cette, euh, que dans cette ville est né Chagall. Il a été nommé, après la Révolution, commissaire euh, pour euh, la ville de, de Vitebsk et c'est là qu'il a créé une école populaire. Ce qui fait qu'il y avait autour de lui vraiment quelque chose de tout à fait nouveau pour Vitebsk, qui était vraiment des euh, peintres de renommée déjà euh, internationale, même qui sont venus dans cette petite ville de Biélorussie. 
après la révolution de 1917, euh, des artistes comme Marc Chagall, El Lissitsky, Kazimir Malevich euh, arrivent tour à tour à Vitebsk. Euh, ils arrivent pour des raisons contextuelles. Ils fuient la misère, la famine liée à la guerre civile, euh, les conditions de vie très dures qui sont celles de Moscou et de Petrograd. Mais euh, ils ne font pas que fuir, ils vont aussi vers un terrain d'accueil qui les attend, en quelque sorte, euh, qui est euh, celui d'une ville d'art, d'une ville qui a une histoire d'art, et euh, où il y a un désir d'art. Поскольку Шагал хочет, чтобы эта школа была как Академия художеств, а в Академии художеств это отделение живописи, скульптуры и архитектуры. Для живописи, с живописью все хорошо, живопись он сам преподает, приезжают живописцы из Петрограда. И в один прекрасный день Шагал встречает Лисицкого, а Лисицкий дипломированный архитектор. И он предлагает Лисицкому стать профессором архитектуры. Лисицкий в октябре 2019 года едет в командировку в Москву, получает литографские камни, краски, бумагу. И он, естественно, встречается с Малевичем, с которым он уже в контакте. И он увозит Малевича практически. Как Малевич писал в Вершинзону, приехали люди из Витебской и вытащили меня из под наступающего голода и холода. Malevich a accepté l'invitation de Litsky pour des raisons matérielles. Parce qu'il il crevait la faim. À, 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 il le dit dans une, lettre, euh, dans une lettre. Il dit, je suis venu ici, je suis en exil, à Vita, au début. Il dit, mais je travaille, on m'a donné une chambre et j'ai de quoi vivre. Et donc il est venu, pour, il a accepté pour des raisons matérielles au départ. Malevich est venu au début de novembre. Вот он поручил Лисицкому перевести супрематизм в объемные формы и разработать концепцию архитектуры будущего на основе супрематизма. И буквально, ну будем считать, что за полтора месяца, за несколько недель Лисицкий изобрел совершенно новый ход, который впоследствии вот он назвал проуны, проект утверждения нового. И Эти работы довольно быстро вышли, сошли с орбиты супрематизма. Он просто, просто иначе на это смотрел. Почему он и написал, что на проволоку мы должны смотреть с шести сторон. Справа, слева, сверху, снизу. Я не воспринимаю их как плоскостное изображение. Они наполнены пространством. Надо сказать, что, с одной стороны, конечно, Малевич не мог не оценить вот этого блестящего прорыва своего лучшего ученика, а с другой стороны, он был обижен изменой ученика. Малевич его в одном из писем попрекнул а, и написал ему, что вы изменили у Нависа, изменили супрематизму, у вас... И доска шахматная, и фигуры ша вроде бы шахматные. И играете вы вроде в шахмат, но ход игры у вас другой. Вот эта работа, это свидетельство э, очень доверительных отношений между Малевичем и Лисицким. Потому что именно Лисицкому Малевич поручил оформить обложку своей книги о новых системах в искусстве. Брошюра Малевича была выпущена 
Pour Malevich, dans son un parcours général, Vitebsk a été un moment capital, crucial. Justement, tout d'abord, parce qu'il a précisé sa philosophie, sa pensée. Il avait les moyens, il le dit, donc d'écrire et de publier. Parmi les rares œuvres, il n'y a pas beaucoup d'œuvres qui ont été peintes, parce qu'il avait une activité d'écriture et une activité d'enseignement. Donc ça lui prenait tout son temps. Mais il a fait quelques œuvres, dont celle-ci, qui justement est très euh, significative, selon moi, de ce tournant que je, dont je parlais, de ce tournant religieux. Malevich joue le mauvais rôle dans l'histoire de cette école de Vitebsk. C'est lui qui l'a mené l'intrigue contre Chagall pour l'écarter, pour prendre sa place. Il aurait même accroché une affiche, l'académie suprématiste sur la façade de l'école, dans l'absence de Chagall. Or, le récit de ces conflits entre les deux artistes, aujourd'hui c'est plutôt un mythe, parce que nous savons que l'histoire a finalement été beaucoup moins dramatique, presque banale. Parce qu'il ne faut pas oublier que l'école populaire d'art s'est créée sur le modèle des SFOMAS, des ateliers d'art libres. Et les étudiants étaient donc libres de choisir leurs professeurs. Ils pouvaient changer la classe s'ils étaient mécontents de leurs enseignants. Or, c'est justement ça ce qui est arrivé en mai 1920. Chagall s'est trouvé devant les classes évidentes peu à peu. La réaction est, est normale, est humaine. Donc euh, il est fourbu, il est amer, il est déçu. Et il quitte euh, l'école et il y quitte même Vitebsk, que sa vie natale, et plus jamais il ne retournera. Euh, il y a beaucoup de mythes à propos de la relation de Chagall et Malevich, que Malevich, plus que ne pas Наганом там, выселял Шагала из Витебского училища. Конечно, это не так. Если бы Шагал не был так обижен измены учеников, он вполне мог бы оставаться в этом училище и продолжать в нем преподавать. Потому что Малевич харизматический учитель, учитель. А Шагал никогда не был учителем. То есть его свобода была невероятная. И поэтому, и поэтому он учитель не мог. Понимаете, он не знал, как это делается. Вот мне ученики рассказывали, это в моей книжке есть, что он им говорил, значит, стоит натура, модель, и он им говорит, Матис бы желтую краску тут бы не положил. Et ce qui est curieux, c'est que ces ans, ils, ils ont profité, ces, tous ces jeunes, euh, d'un départ de Chagall pour Moscou pour se aller vers Malevich. Et bon, Chagall a, a peut-être dit par la suite que Malevich avait intrigué, mais je peux, on sait aujourd'hui qu'il il, n'a pas intrigué. C'est simplement qu'ils ont été attirés par euh, le côté prophétique, disons, de Malevich. Et ils ont déjà décidé qu'ils ne sont pas de l'éducation, mais de l'éducation. Et c'est comme ça que se fait ce merveilleux réunion au Nabis. Les affirmateurs du nouveau en art. Le, même, le mot russe « utvirdit » c'est même les affirmateurs fondateurs, on pourrait dire, de, du nouveau en art. Ils décorèrent le и залы заседаний в хронике деятельности УНАВИС корреспондент журнала «Эрмитаж» пишет, что после одной, после одной праздничной демонстрации, когда рабочие увидели наши декорации и знамена, сделанные группой УНАВИС, они устроили нам овацию.
Vitebsk est devenu suprématiste. Vitebsk est vraiment partout, euh, sur les murs, sur les, euh, sur les moyens de transport, dans les théâtres. La philosophie euh, suprématiste, contre le constructivisme, on ne peut pas vaincre la nature. Par exemple, Lazar Hidekel a continué comme architecte également dans cette ligne-là. Il a fait une place dans ses architectures, même de ville, où avec le béton, il a essayé d'introduire la nature. Витебский отец вместе с Ильей Чашником написали и издали книгу «Аэро». В этом издании Лазар Хидекель впервые в 20 веке поставил вопрос о взаимодействии цивилизации и природы. спросил его, правильно ли мы живем, правильно ли мы развиваем вот те потрясающие идеи. И я бы спросил его, э, вот я живу в Нью-Йорке, и я хожу по улицам, и я вижу вот все то, о чем вы мечтали с Малевичем Лисицким, вот эти фасады, э, гигантские объемы, которые растворяются в небесах, это то, э, что я бы хотел спросить тебя, как вы могли предвидеть это все, находясь в Витебске, который я увидел, к сожалению, буквально недавно. Я понял, какой это был ограниченный масштаб. И вообще, вот как к вам не зашло вот это прозрение, вот эта это вот потрясающая идея, которую я пытаюсь понять всю жизнь и так и не понял до конца. L'école de Vitebsk est aussi intense que brève. Dès 1921, elle devient la cible des critiques assez virulentes de la part du gouvernement bolchevique, jugeant l'art sans objet, n'étant plus conforme avec les valeurs prolétaires. Il décide donc même de couper les subsides à l'établissement. La première promotion diplômée en mai 1922 est aussi la dernière. L'été venu, l'école se disperse. Malevich part avec un groupe d'étudiants à Petrograd pour continuer leur aventure collective, mais sous une nouvelle forme. D'autres enseignants et étudiants regagnent Moscou. La parenthèse de liberté dont Vitebsk a bénéficié s'éclot. Et l'histoire formidable de cette école arrive à son terme.
ちでしょう。薬を。Good, mo uh, good evening, dear friends. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and first of all, of course, I want to thank um, the Jewish Museum for organizing this event. Uh, Claudia Nach is the curator of the museum. She is here. Uh, also, uh, Jane Weiss and uh, Paulina Fedotova, who were working on this event. I'm very happy that this event uh, took place because this exhibition actually was in making for a few years. It started as an exhibition of the Vitebsk Art School, but later it was developed into the another exhibition which called Chagall, Lisitsky, and Malevich, and was more focused on the complicated relationships between the three giants in Russian art. Uh, and in Centre Pompidou, it was like that, but I'm happy that here in the Jewish Museum, students uh, had, um, especially Lazar Hidekel, had more like space. It's the same works, but it was more attention. I'm very happy that his work was chosen for the uh, poster of the exhibition, and it was our great pleasure to see uh, this um, banners flapping in the wind on Fifth Avenue, uh, which is really um, a kind of recognition of Lazar Hidekel and the Vitebskar School. Uh, uh, we are happy also about um, uh, that this is really a great uh, moment for the Vitebsk Art School. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Lazar Hidekel was one of the um, uh, most important uh, students, and he belonged to the core group, uh, which um, after became known as Unovis, uh, affirmers of the new art. And uh, uh, Lazar Hidekel uh, had this incredible teachers. Uh, first was Chagall, uh, and actually here Shatsky said that Chagall was not a good teacher. Lazar Hidekel had totally different opinion about this. He really liked him as a teacher. Uh, they were very close. Uh, he, um, Chagall personally invited him to the school. Uh, Lazar Hidekel was awarded on uh, almost every exhibition, and uh, when he was just 15 years old, uh, Chagall invited him to participate in a very important exhibition of uh, Moscow and local artists with such luminaries like uh, uh, Malevich, Popova, uh, um, Kandinsky, uh, and so on. Uh, so Chagall was a very good teacher. Also, he invited Lazar Hidekel to plein air, and they were working together. And uh, Chagall um, really remembered his uh, student as well. And and in 1973, when uh, Chagall came to St. Petersburg, it was just only one visit to Russia uh, since he left the um, uh, Soviet Union forever in the 23, um, he, of course, met with Lazar Hedekel. And he said, Lazar, um, why did you become the architect? Uh, you were so gifted artist, uh, and I always believed that you will be a great painter. Uh, also, um, I'm was always thankful to you that you defended me from this bandit Malevich. <laughs> they really had very bad relationships. And Lazar Hidekel, even he, of course, chose a new way in art, and he became one of the 
more prominent suprematists in uh, history uh, because there were not so many suprematist artists actually. Uh, he also uh, had a very um, like a warm feelings towards uh, his first teacher, um, uh, Chagall. Uh, his second teacher was Lisitsky uh, because Lisitsky opened the um, uh, studio of architecture and typography and Lazar Hidekel wanted to be an architect because his father was a builder. So uh, his experience in the Lisitsky studio was also pretty significant uh, and it was finished with this book, um, uh, Aero, uh, where his uh, started to talk, he was 16 years old, but he was talking about how to solve um, uh, contradictions between development of civilization and the nature. He was very much attached to the nature from the very beginning. Uh, we uh, called him, and uh, in Switzerland, for example, his manifesto was even uh, one of the first manifestos of uh, modern um, uh, era, uh, and called like first ecological um, thinker in the modern hi history. Uh, he was very much attached, and he uh, this love for nature uh, was really very important for him through all his life. Uh, but uh, at that time in Vitip school, he developed his suprematist works. And um, because he was so important and because he was uh, so close to Malevich, uh, he uh, actually uh, became one of the just three suprematist artists because the uh, other students who were also uh, students in this school, they were not able uh, to, to get this threshold to abstraction. It's not easy for them. And we know that some artists were writing about this and complaining, and, but it was not possible. For him, it was like very easy. All this work that you see in this exhibition were created by the basically boy from 16 uh, to 18 years old. It's just unbelievable, such a beautiful finished work. I want to say a few words about um, the significance of uh, this school. Uh, it was the first laboratory, art laboratory, maybe in modern history. Uh, it, it was um, started in 19, almost uh, the same time, a little bit later, uh, Bauhaus came to, um, uh, to, uh, to history, and uh, Futimas also uh, was um, formed even before, but at this time they were not so much a advanced as Vitebsk art school was. This was absolutely unique school. Teachers uh, were learning suprematism and teaching. Uh, students were also learning suprematism uh, and uh, um, and teaching. Uh, Lazar Hedekel was also a teacher. Uh, when Yehuda Pen, uh, uh, academist uh, uh, dr professor uh, who belonged to an academic school, uh, left this school because it was like too probably left for him, uh, Lazar Hedekel was teaching drawing in a drawing class. Uh, when Lisitsky, uh, at the end of the 1920s, left uh, Vitebsk, uh, he was teaching architecture. And at the same time, he was learning uh, suprematism. So it was a very, very special, uh, special school. And I think, uh, I'm very happy that now uh, the attention uh, was brought not just to the individual artist, but also to the school. And, uh, it needs like two m more, uh, you know, big projects really to research and to, uh, to show what uh, was the result of this work. Uh, also, uh, students and professors in this school, in this uh, creative collective, they believed in research and process, and it was more important for them than even finished works.
Uh, I want to say like a few words that recently, for example, um, a new exhibition of Lazar Hidekel was opened in the St. Petersburg, in the major museum, Russian museum. Uh, and it's, um, I'm very happy that uh, another work uh, also now on the main street in St. Petersburg is here on Fifth Avenue, on uh, 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 Nevsky Prospect. Uh, and the exhibition was very, very well received. Very well received by students, by uh, colleagues, by public. Uh, it just like was time to return. Um, and um, also we had a beautiful opening. Uh, and some people were saying that Lazar Hidekel still doesn't have recognition that he deserves. And um, at the time I said, you know, yes, um, probably some people don't know him, but um, art uh, um, is coming to people in different ways. It could be imposed by the government, it could be imposed by ideology, by art market, but also sometimes it finds people who really need it. And this is actually, uh, will be a first question, because today we have uh, Daniel Libeskind, who opened, who discovered Hideakel um, like a few decades ago by himself. So, um, and, uh, it, and this is my first question, Daniel, to you. How did you discover Lazar Hidekel? Uh, how important it was for you at that time? And maybe it's still important for you. Thank you very much. First, let me say this, is, uh, this exhibition here with Lazar Hidekel really at the center, and of course, the Sitsky Chagall Malevich is one of the best exhibitions in maybe the last decade or 20 years in New York. It's not a huge exhibition, but the works are really masterpieces on a different level altogether from art that is popularized by museums or commercial interests or simply sort of public opinion. Uh, how did I discover Lazar Heidegger? I was very interested in that period of, of art, in particular in Vitebsk. And it seems to me that this was really, as you said already, the epicenter of modernity before Bauhaus, before other places in the world discovered possibilities of a new, new city, new world. I think it was these prophets, and I consider Heidek really a, a prophet because he was very young in comparison even to Malevich and others, to really open a whole new world of wonders uh, in every direction from the most transcendental one, which has to do with nature and what is beyond, but also the most practical uh, planning of cities and, as you mentioned, ecology uh, of the world. So these are, he was a genius, there's no doubt about it, one of the really masters of art. And I agree that uh, the world does not know enough, really, right now, because the world is not even that familiar yet. But true art, really has a future. Past art is the art that is forgotten. True art always has a bigger future than its past. And I think that's certainly true for Rosa Heidekel because when you look at those drawings and, and, and uh, some of them very small or the watercolors or some of the things that, that are here on the screen, you see that they are really inexhaustible in terms of their ideas. And that's what really interests me. Uh, you know, what is the relevance of this work? You know, I'm not a historian. I'm not an art historian, and that's not my field. I'm an architect. But these are the works, these are the sources, I would say, of modern thinking. Never mind the forms. The forms are what, what they are, but it's the seed of really modern thinking about space, about light, about movement, and also about the future. So, yeah, what is the importance of Lazar Heidekel? What is the importance of Lisitsky? Uh, they are, of course, all different personalities, but uh, I think what unites them is something incredibly radical. And the radical thing is that the world can be changed, that the inherited world is not an inevitable fatality. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I just published a book called The Edge of Order, uh, and I was thinking about it. Most people who are in a city, any city, it doesn't have to be a city as beautiful as New York, but any place in the world, most people think it's just natural that they are there. It's just, 
it's inevitable, like, like the clouds are inevitable or, or the rain is inevitable. But the cities are not inevitable. They were produced, all of them were produced from a drawing, by the way. You can't build a city, you can't build a house, you can't even build a garage or a chair without a drawing. So they all came out of a drawing. And that's the magic, I think, of Heidegger and Vitebs, the amazing power of drawing. And those drawings are, if you look at them, some of them are very small drawings, maybe just you know, something very delicate, but they are immensely full of future possibilities of what those drawings really stand for. And the drawing might have a square, just four lines, uh, enclosing you know, the, the white page. But my god, it's really something beyond the word square and beyond the word space and beyond the you know, word suprematism even, uh, and, and even beyond the word viteps. So yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've been a student of those masters uh, ever since I discovered them. And they really came into consciousness probably in the 60s. I mean, you know more. You know, when first, uh, with the kind of collapse of the Soviet regime, those works became, uh, sort of came more into circulation and the books and sometimes even to exhibits. But I think that really changed the world. I think you would not have a movement uh, that was called deconstructivism uh, in the Museum of Modern Art show uh, in the 80s, which I participated in. You would never have had that movement without the discovery of those really geniuses like uh, Heidegger and Lissitzky and others who really paved the way for a transformation. So what can I, how can I end? I can say this, you know, Karl Marx said that you should transform the world. Rimbaud, the French poet, said you should change your life. But I think what these Masters and Heidegger in particular did says you have to change the way you see, yeah. the you know the city or or the sky or or what is around you, which is a much more practical and the same a more radical endeavor because it's finally political. And I think the tragedy is, of course, that the Soviets, the dictators, Stalin, uh, really, you know, I don't know how Heidegger actually survived. You know, he was probably close to being arrested. I don't know the, sto the full story, but I don't know how, uh, how such a person was able to survive. It was not easy, mm -hmm. not easy. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell, you know, <laughs> if yeah. people would be interested. Yeah, but uh, were, uh, let, know, me end, let me just end uh, on, on a personal note. You know, you come from somewhere. Your work doesn't just originate just out, out, out of yourself. Where does it come from? It comes from your parents. You know, you're brought up in a certain way, in a Jewish way, in my case. Uh, my father, who only finished grade three, he, my, both my parents were survivors of the Holocaust. They had no chance to be educated. My father was a, I would say, a self-made constructivist suprematist artist. Uh, when he was in his 70s and my mother died, she t told him, Nachman, you know, you should just paint. And as an old man, you would expect somebody like that to pick up a brush and paint a landscape, blue skies, you know, a flower. My father started with a square, with a wedge of a triangle, a red circle. Yeah, I mean, hardcore, I can tell you. And it came from somewhere because I once talked to him and I don't know whether you know the name Moshe Brotherson. Moshe Brotherson was a Yiddish poet a Yiddish theater director mm -hmm. in, he came from Russia, after the revolution they moved to Wuj, the city where I, I came from, and uh, Moshe Brotherson established two theaters, the Ararat Theater in Wuj and a puppet theater. Mm -hmm. And my father as a young man uh, was part of the group of admirers of Brotherson to help you know, do the sets and you know, do the puppets and do the posters. By the way, Gigan and Schumacher, if you know those two names, yeah. two great Jewish actors and later comedians, even in Israel, when they came to Israel, they were famous, famous Yiddish comedians, uh, were part of the Brotherson Theater. So again, and Brotherson himself was a close friend of Lissitzky because in Moscow in 19... 19 or 1920, Brotherson and Lissitzky established a club uh, for uh, poets and artists, a Jewish club, a Yiddish club. 
Uh, actually, I think it was actually called Chad Gadya. Yeah. You know, which is so. Anyway, everything is connected. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, we also have here in attendance uh, one uh, person uh, who is also the architect, uh, um, thinker, I would say, about architecture, uh, and uh, a teacher. Uh, he belonged to the next generation, um, generation of my son, basically. Uh, and for him, uh, Lazar Hedekal is also a very important figure. So I want Cruz Garcia. Uh, Cruz Garcia and Natalie Frankowski, they work together. Uh, they contributed the article to our um, latest um, catalog. Uh, and uh, we, lo we, we will learn about Cruz on the internet uh, when we just Google Hedekal and we see that the uh, Cruz and Natalie, uh, they were writing about him. And um, uh, for them, so better tell how important for you was the discovery of Lazar Hedekal when you did it and how it works today with, uh, in your teaching uh, uh, process. It's kind of difficult to speak after uh, Daniel Lewiskin speak, of course. Okay. Because Daniel, it's kind of always <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for us, uh, I'll just it's, it's, it's half anecdotal, but also I think historical too. Um, so, so we founded We Architecture Think Tank in 2008 in the middle of the financial crisis. Uh, so Natalie is French and I'm Puerto Rican. I mean, to talk about how universal these things are, right? Uh, and we were living in China at that moment. Um, so it's kind of funny, <laughs> but also very contemporary. Um, and somehow we were we were working on on our first book. Uh, it was called um, Pure Hardcore Icons: A Manifesto on Pure Form in Architecture. And then we were working, trying to find the origins of some some forms that were not platonic, but that seemed to be universal in the contemporary architecture. And uh, a lot of the of our heroes, you know, like uh, Libeskin, like Remkulha, Saha Hadid, and a lot of the people that we grew up learning from somehow always led, had some connection to some mysterious form of, um, of cultural production that was very difficult to find out. That it was very difficult to pin down, it was very difficult to find information, literature, um, it was very obscure. And the more we look at it, the more intrigued we were, but the more difficult it became. Uh, also, we were in China and the internet is blocked, so imagine how difficult can it be. <laughs> um, um, but the more we look, we start buying catalogs that we find, uh, like out of print catalogs in California and trying to chip all this information. At the same time, trying to figure out things about architecture, like as young practitioners, uh, and also about art. Um, and, and somehow, um, we found about the most typical names, like Elisitsky and um, Malievich and um, Ilya Shasnik and all these people. But somehow there was a disconnection between what they were doing and the thing that we were looking for, that was that, that sort of missing link. And one day, somehow, we found about Hideki. Uh, we read a bit about it. Somehow, there was a connection because uh, I started find, finding about you. Um, and it was not until uh, Columbia University was publishing a book on the, on the um, climate, mm -hmm. and the, they asked a bunch of young officers around the world what was the first architecture that made you think about the environment in a different way? And we pointed out to one of those, it, it was almost that image that you just saw now, and it will loop again, uh, one of those uh, aero cities of, uh, of Lazar Hidekel in the landscape. And it's so radical if you think about it, but also so important and so contemporary. And after that, we sort of like, we trash everything and started again in a way, because it was almost like, uh, like discovering a truth that was kept hidden from, from you for a long time. Um, uh, and then in that fascination, we, st we, we tried to track down and try to find as much as we could of these works um, that were dealing with the environment in a really different way. Uh, first of all, the environment was still there somehow. There were cities, but the landscape didn't disappear, right? This is one of the images we made, yeah. uh, like reclaiming those images and making them contemporary in a way. Not like they need to, but trying to sort of Bring, bring them back to life, because we felt that suprematism in architecture, it, it was not a move, movement that stopped, but that somehow lost its name, 
and people think of it like you know the 20s and the 30s and for us it's is something that is uh, is as contemporary today I, don't, I cannot think of any other movement that was looking for a form of universalism and a form of radical environmentalism uh, a really radical form of coexistence with the environment and with societies that are diverse and universal and beautiful uh, other than this really like i think like it is literally that new beginning that the black square was trying to find uh, and somehow is manifested architecturally it's not anymore about painting or installation or film but it has a manifestation about the real built environment uh, and since then uh, we've been teaching in europe in in china and we've been in, here teaching in this country since three years somehow end up in taliesin the the home of frank lloyd wright you know the yeah. the builder of the guggenheim that is just like two or three blocks away and then living there uh, in taliesin we discover also the really close relationship of frank lloyd wright the most american of american architects right like the, the like the myth of american architecture and how close it is to this really universal uh form of architecture that was generated in Vitebsk. Uh, and, and, and somehow that's what we try to pass to our students today. And we have like around, currently around like 120 architecture students, literally in the middle of Nebraska and all the other people that have been following what we were, we're doing through all the new media, like Instagram or whatever, uh, publications, online publications and everything. And they all ex so excited about discovering this. Again, it's still, somehow it's still a secret. Like, yeah. We need intellectuals and historians and, and exhibitions like this to, to hear the name for the first time. And I, I think that that's almost a crime against humanity. Uh, because it is the, the things that can free us, crime, yeah. the things that can free us and that, and that search for a universal beauty, uh, like that, that real union uh, is kept away from design schools somehow, out of sheer ignorance or uh, some sort of evil force mm -hmm. uh, operating behind the scenes. And, and it may be to do with politics too, right? Like, it, it was very difficult for this country to acknowledge any type, of, any type of Russian success for a long time. And it's still difficult, right? Like, if we, it, yeah, as we again, see with the current yes. uh, political climate, right? So, uh, how to recognize this Jewish kid, you know, in the, in the middle of a, of a town in Bulgaria, uh, to be like Belarusia. in Belarusia. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. That always happens uh, with many different countries. Uh, in in the Belarusia, like creating something that is without without him, without them, without him, without them. You don't have like the Ellsworth Kellys of life. You don't have the Frank Stellas. None of that exists, and that's real. That's like you don't have minimalism. Yet. We don't have minimalism or conceptualism. You know, even yeah. uh, even dialogism is an origin for conceptualism. So I think it's, a, it's it's very tragic that it's like that, and hopefully we can somehow help to bring the vitality that this projects have that I, th I think they're not finished and somehow we can aim to continue them today. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately this movement was interrupted. We know why. Uh, it was a Stalin's time and it was even difficult to survive, not just to continue to work. Uh, but Lazar Hedekel was a lucky one. He survived. Uh, he continued to work all his life. Uh, basically, all these works which were created um, after, I would say, 35, 1935, were created for hi by himself for himself, basically. What we called under table, to the table. Uh, in Russia, we have this expression. Uh, and uh, he was not even, he was a teacher. He was a professor in the architectural school. And he was a beloved professor. But students didn't know his history. They just uh, was thinking that he may belong 
too constructivist or something like that. The word suprematism was not really well known and uh, well spoken at that time. And uh, if constructivism, because it had political uh, implications and uh, um, it was developed, you know, the, the knowledge about constructivism was developed in the West by the um, um, liberal professors and liberal writers, uh, suprematism was enigma. Uh, nobody could understand. It was like a, so like a religion. Hmm? It also has to do with emigration because many constructivist artists emigrated to the West unlike supremacist artists that uh, they didn't. Unlike there were yeah, like a few so, of them. So yeah. it has to do yeah. with the distribution of, with dis uh, of information to the Western countries Absolutely. as well. And next question to you. Yeah. Oh, since we, we are so <laughs> anecdotal, um, yeah. I have spent long research periods in Vitebsk, uh, researching in the archives. And for those who have been to Vitebsk, you might know how difficult it is to be there, especially in the winter. Uh, the archives are very Russian-style archives, whatever that means. Um, that means that they are not scanners. Um, the archives of the school, of the UNOVI school, are mixed with the state, with state documents. A uh, part of the archive is uh, together with the, and incorporated into the archives of the Communist Party. So practically, it takes a lot of time, dedicated time, a lot of energy, uh, with uh, sometimes unpredictable results. So uh, scanning is not allowed at the time. Photography was not allowed. In, so practically, we had to copy to hand, written and copy by hand, uh, everything we could find in the archives. I've spent there uh, the, the first time three months, and then I went for another six months. So that was a really long period. And then when I came back uh, to New York, I had a discussion with um, about the results and some of the information I had found in the, in the archives with uh, Charlotte Douglas. And Charlotte said to me, you haven't yet visited Regina and Mark Hidekel. And I said, no, I don't even know. I know the name. I saw the name in the archives. I know that he was a student there. I found enormous amount of information, his enquete, his registration form, uh, some uh, other details from the studio in the period in St. Petersburg. But I didn't know that a special collection and archive existed, not even in Russia. That could have been a nightmare. But it was next door. It was in New York. So that's how I met uh, Regina and Mark and Raman. I visited, uh, apart from the amazing hospitality and uh, scholar generosity, I visited their house several times and we had incredibly amazing discussions about the, about the period, about the school, uh, Lazar's, Lazar Hidekel's techniques, materials, ways of thinking, um, books that they were in his library at the time that he was a student. So that was, um, it was a discovery. Obviously, it wasn't my own discovery, as we are sharing the same experience in the panel. Uh, but again, from a scholar po point of view, uh, it was a unique moment, having access and being able to see all these works in one place um, without context necessarily, um, just the drawings, small drawings, bigger drawings, uh, with, uh, painted with pencil, watercolors, uh, sketches, designs from all different periods. And that's really important because you, in that way you could see the trajectory how an idea that started um, as, a, as a great experiment of collectivism, that was apparently one of these, although they all celebrated collective and collectivism, that was the first unique example where artists worked as a collective. They exhibited together. They signed paintings as one of these. Uh, they, they just contributed to a common idea. And this idea was, is wonderfully expressed in the Aero journal that uh, Ilya Chasnik and, uh, and Lazar Hidekel mm -hmm. published in 1920, where they are discussing about the building of a, of a new creativity, building a creative new world. And this world was meant to be built uh, following some of the main principles of suprematism economy of means, speed, dynamism, strength of materials, and spread as even as possible. And also with the use and assist of different signs. 
the science of suprematism. And the science of suprematism follows the language of abstraction. It's like in mathematics. We, there, is, there is an idea, and this idea can be expressed as a math, in a mathematical formula, in an equation. And this equation is full of signs. And these signs, these signs are economical in structure, but they are very rich in meaning. And the result is a new constructed world. And that was part of the, um, of the suprematist philosophy at that time. And the same applies to, from my perspective, su to suprematist architecture, which is, again, is not anymore a debatable term, but uh, until recently it was an unknown term. Uh, but they wrote extensively, they discussed extensively at the time about suprematist architecture, the, the intersection of architectural forms that they were held together, not necessarily by uh, the average or the common architectural materials, but they were held together by unseen forces. And they were, they were all these structures, no matter how abstract they were, like squares, triangles, straight lines, dots, small points, or a sequence of points, or curved lines, they were all providing new shapes, new forms that they could float in space, but at the same time being meaningful and construct, being able to construct a new space. And that was part of the discussion of building a new creative world. And indeed, it was a brave new work, an amazing discovery for the period and it for all of us. A progress of a new world, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, very soon uh, it was finished uh, because um, uh, Stalin uh, turned Russia into bureaucracy, as Trotsky said, and uh, this romantic period of revolution was over. Uh, since we are in a Jewish museum here in New York, it's not a coincidence in my view that Lisitsky that Chagall, that Heidegger were Jews. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the photograph of the students and read the names, it is an overwhelming percentage of young Jewish artists and architects. Pretty much everybody is a Malevich. Excuse me? Pretty yeah. much everybody is a Malevich. Malevich. was very close, yeah, very close to this group yeah. and, and part of this group. And I, I think it, it, it's open to thinking, why? Why was it like that? What, what was, in the dreams of Jews who were emancipated by the revolution, who had a completely new horizon of what communism could mean, true equality, true creativity, yeah. what it was that produced an art, which I think is in some way, I use the word prophetic or biblical in some mm -hmm. way, it wasn't a metaphor because it's open, it's very disciplined and very structured, but it's also extremely open to the future. And there's something, really deeply Jewish about this art. Even when you look at the dialogue between uh, Chagall and, and the, figure, the figurative element and abstraction and the struggle in, in both directions and the victory of, of the kind of pure spaces mm -hmm. over the, let's say victory in the, in the Vitebsk sense, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, over, over the more figurative and sentimental nostalgic themes. It's, it's a very interesting topic to consider. And I think it coincides uh, if one looks at the literature of the time uh, Ilya Ehrenberg and Pasternak and, and many others uh, working. Many of them were killed uh, and murdered by Stalin. Uh, all the Yiddish writers, virtually every one of them, uh, was murdered in a, in a purge uh, systematically. The great theater directors, uh, you, you probably you know the history. So, uh, but it's an interesting question, really, because we know that uh, Jews have not gravitated toward figurative art. Uh, it was not part of, of the Jewish tradition, but towards an abstraction, abstract, ab abstraction of the world. And I find this very interesting in this exhibition, particularly when I think of the other students, not maybe as brilliant as Heidegger, but who were there and participated in the discussions. Uh, yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think that because they all uh, went through Ishiva and yes. they knew that there is invisible world. Exactly. And for them, it was uh, 
you know, uh, very familiar. And um, you know what is interesting? Uh, that um, when uh, Malevich, in 22, when the, they finished the school, they went to um, St. Peter, uh, Petrograd, Leningrad later. Uh, and Lazar Hedekel uh, became a student of architectural school. And he, at same time, was working, continued to his work with Malevich uh, in his research uh, institute. Uh, and uh, um, Lazar Hedekel was trying to help Malevich to survive because this institute was uh, always subject to revisions and they say this is a monastery, not an institute. So uh, they invited Malevich to do lectures uh, in the architectural school. And uh, Malevich came to the school and gave like a few lectures and student asked uh, to finish this lectures because they couldn't understand him. And I, uh, uh, we were talking with Lazar Hedegel about this, and I say, oh my God, Lazar, how you in 15 years were able to understand Malevich and this, you know, grown um, man already, like 19, uh, 20, were not able to understand Malevich. Uh, and he said, this is what, what happened. Uh, so probably these Jewish boys, they were very curious. And it was a very special also moment in Jewish history. Absolutely. I think that's that moment where uh, people who came from deep Jewish uh, religious backgrounds mm. no. uh, rejected mm -hmm. religion, mm -hmm. rejected all of that, mm -hmm. and transformed all of that uh, that depth of knowledge into a, into a new world, as into if new without world, any, yeah. with, with, with effortlessly, as if it just, but it's, it's interesting because modernism itself is is a mysterious phenomenon. Totally. If you really think, you know, where did, does it, as you said, totally. you know, where, where, did it, where does it, where come, does it from? come from? But and, what and to it, uh, Vitebsk also to, just to bring it down to reality, uh, it was part of the pale of settlement. So this, right. um, this lack of freedom to yes. be able to emic to move to another city as a young student, as a dreamer, uh, as a visionary, to be able to go to another city and study, it was forbidden for Jews to move uh, from, uh, the, from the pale of settlement for studies mm. or for any other travel reasons to another place, that created um, a kind of, um, of necessity, first of all, to, to react to it. And it could be, as depressive it is, could be equally very inspirational mm -hmm. and very creative. Although it was an extremely sad situation, it became a source of, um, of creation and of inspiration for, for all these very, very young students. There were students in the, in the group of Malevich that they were registered at the, like Yudin, who yeah. registered in the group at the age of 16 or 15. <laughs> so they were really, really young students that they, they fought or they dreamt or uh, they were hoping for a new, for the creation of a new world. But the, you know, in a way, it still remains really contemporary. All those yes, problems exactly. we're talking about, of course. And 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 I think like also something that we've been thinking about too is trying to find those origins. Is that the the, the fact that they're not religious, right? So they don't belong to that community of religious people. But also, they, they were never counted as part of the state either. Like, not not in Russia, but no. not in Germany. So you have all these really universal intellectuals and really universal. Artists that, very independent, that yeah. are really independent from any yeah. type of simplistic reading of what the nation state meant, yeah. and and that probably also has a, some sort of like a magnifying effect on on the on the capacity to imagine a really radical new beginning where. They were very independent, and they didn't want to be affiliated with the government. Lazar Hedekel, for example, he was not a member of the Communist Party. And um, it was one episode, and we will talk uh, soon about this, uh, when the, uh, Mark Hedekel, Mark, his son, uh, he was very successful uh, in the beginning of his career. He, he um, built a few monuments, and he uh, was awarded a state prize, uh, being like 24, 25 years old. And at this time, in 75, there was an international uh, project, American-Russian project, Apo Apollo Soyuz. And these generals came to Mark, and they told him, you know, Mark, uh, we need to create like uh, new habitats for moon. Uh, and, um, but you have to get a clearance. Uh, 
he came home and Lazar Hedekel said, I'm very happy about this cosmic project, but no clearance, no relationship with the government. You will be their slave. Mm -hmm. And Mark uh, didn't do this. And finally, they found a form. Uh, they uh, renamed the project um, in another name, and uh, uh, Mark never got this clearance. Uh, so, um, and the cosmic and suprematism is a very, very special relationship because actually suprematism was born when um, Malevich said that he looked uh, over horizon and he got into the cosmic space. So this is how suprematism is an art movement was born. And for these young uh, children, uh, it was so important to create uh, cosmic uh, works. And Lazar Hedekel did it when he was uh, 17, 18 years old. Uh, he created these bubbles, uh, which will go to the cosmos. And uh, now uh, some uh, scholars are saying that this is a program how to develop uh, the way to, to, to do the moon today, that this is very real. Uh, and the Roman Hedekel, who is a grandson, third generation, uh, he is very much interested in developing this idea of um, uh, development of the cosmos, um, ideas of suprematism, uh, and he does some uh, animations, and um, also maybe he will say like a few words. He will show some. Uh, actually, what is interesting that um, Lazar Hedekel. Up some animations. And so I just I, I attempted to create various animations and the 3D visualization based on Lazar Hedekel's drawings and sketches, sort of to show the scale, the significance. So the first several drawings depict the first several drawings depict sort of cosmic themes in his work because Lazar Kidekel's creative period, early twenties, even teens, was the beginning sort of the beginning of aeronautical age and also beginning of the space age, and he was also very much influenced, just like the. Kazimir Malevich by the Russian cosmism, by ideas of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was considered to be the father of the space, te space technology and space exploration in Russia. And uh, in many of his sketches, he shows those futuristic cities that are floating above this, the Earth and orbit, or even up above the clouds. They're completely self-sustained. This is sort of space cosmic visions. That's one more slide. They were, <coughs> Russian cosmists were already considering ideas of traveling to other planets, to even to other solar systems. And uh, elements of Russian cosmism also permeated suprematism art. I mean, Kazimir Malevich was also very much influenced by those ideas. Here I have ideas of floating cities or self-contained floating cities that float above the ground that are sort of completely independent from the environment that are self-sustaining and also sort of self-organizing. He has a lot of sketches depicting those themes. Because suprematism believed in self-development. It's like organic self-development of forms. As a living organism. As a as living as organism, yeah. Lazar Kidekel also developed a lot of sketches, a lot of architectural drawings showing cities that are elevated above the landscape and that are independent from the natural environment and also don't interfere with natural environment. They create sort of minimal footprint and minimal impact on natural environment. So in uh, this type of a city would be 
located high above nature. It would be completely self-contained. Probably it could house thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people. And uh, people would work, live there. And then, so since the natural environment would be untouched, during the leisure time, people can descend and uh, sort of enjoy pure natural environment. Here is more visualizations also based on his drawings. This is sort of to superimpose the existing city because existing cities that occupy natural environment, it uh, obviously pollutes, it creates footprints. It has to remove a lot of vegetation. It also creates a lot of congestion, but cities in urban environments that are elevated above Earth are absolutely free from congestion, from pollution, and sort of offer much better ecological possibilities. Uh, also interesting that uh, Mark has an idea that uh, if we will, like, you know, develop our way to the moon, better to not really land on moon and to bring our Earth experience of building here, uh, but just, you know, go around with our artificial cities. Here is Not more examples. To, uh, also, okay, maybe. so now... Uh, I, I, it's a provocation, so I have to speak. <laughs> you know, you can see now the contradiction between utopian thought, thought of the impossible, and the idea of making the utopia on this earth. Yeah. Because you can immediately see, as nice as these drawings are, and imaginary sort of uh, collages, uh, really, I would say the absurdity of connecting those two extremes. And I think this is what made Lazar some, somebody very special. Because when you look at his drawing of cities, they are not done by a computer. They are done in an artistic way. They are, they, are, they are images of possibilities of imagination. And of course, we know the modernist follies trying to realize the utopia on Earth. That was exactly what communism did. That was supposed to be the utopia on Earth. That's, you know, fascism. That was the utopia on Earth. Uh, that was building all those things. And, and we can see that, why doesn't it work? Why does it work in drawings, in paintings, mm -hmm. in books, in poetry? But why doesn't it work in architecture? This is a question I asked myself many times. Uh, probably because architecture is so much more unconscious than thought, that we, we, we don't thematize it, we don't think about you know, where we sleep and why we are sleeping in a horizontal position <laughs> and why we are eating at a table and why we are walking towards a horizon point. Uh, so there is a mystery, there's a gap. Uh, and to fill that gap, it's impossible to do it through kind of a connection between the, I would say, the impossible utopia, which is the only one worth living in, yeah. and the possible dystopia, dystopia, yeah. Yeah. Like, dystopia, which is kind of the nightmare of, you know, living in space and, you know, landing on the yeah. moon and all those things. But, you know, as you were talking, I, I, I had the feeling that, you know, you asked that very interesting, where does it come from? In the last book uh, before he died, Stephen Hawking has this kind of definitive book, which is uh, uh, simple answers to big questions about the cosmos. And he says the following, the cosmos has absolutely no reason to be. Mm -hmm. It's gratuitous. Mm -hmm. He says, I learned all my uh, life that things have causes, but I've come to understand that there is no cause. There is no preceding state. It's just, it's just what it is. It's just what it is. It's, and I think it's just the explosion of, Heidegger and all those geniuses yeah. in Vitebsk was the explosion that is similar, I think, to our understanding of the Big Bang, yeah. that there was nothing before, yeah. and we cannot understand in any causal way, historically, where did it come from? And how, but can we live today without utopia and drive? No, I actually think we can't live without utopia. I, I just had a little article in the New York Times. They asked, what have we forgotten? And I said, uh, we for, you know, we've generally given up on utopia because we've seen the dystopias, uh, you know, all around us. But I think a life without utopia 
is not it's worth, not worth living. Living, yeah. It, yeah. it really, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's not me who's saying it. It's Martin Buber. It's great thinkers, great, uh, you know, <laughs> prophets. What would a life be without thinking of a better future? Mm -hmm. How would it look? How could it be constructed? Why would it even be do? Why, why would we do, do anything? Exactly. At all? Yeah. exactly. And also, it's exactly. interesting that the works yeah. by Hidekel they have um, they they have links with. Uh, Contemporary with the Russian cosmism yeah. that was the idea more related to spirituality yes. and spiritual thinking originated from Tchaikovsky from the 19th yeah. century onwards. Uh, and at the same time, um, they represented some contemporary utopian ideas. Mm. And again, utopia by definition has no geopolitical yeah, course, yeah, totally and place. geographic and um, political connotations. So all of this is incorporated into new way of thinking. And because he was, he was a 20th century person, uh, the technological or scientific or new advances in his time were incorporated into a new way of thinking. So it is in between traditional cosmism for, for Russian a way of thinking and new ideas of utopianism as were offered at the time. And of course, he had to balance, as a Russian citizen, the dystopian situation, uh, the dystopian reality, with the utopian thinking. Well, that, that came to probably the best uh, conclusion in Khlebnikov, uh, where he, when he suggested that the Great Lakes could be transformed to soup. You know, you could just put the right ingredients and everybody would have a gigantic soup you could eat, you know, all around the lake. I mean, what a, you know, it's a practical, Sounds practical pretty good. it's a pretty good thought, actually. Especially now, like it's rainy and snowy. <laughs> or uh, Bogdanov in the Red Star, yes. who, writes, yeah. uh, who has this, uh, who writes about uh, the new planet, they invent a new planet, they move the society, they go to Mars. And it's a group of people that, they, that have been transferred from Earth to Mars and they are living there and they build a new society. Um, it has some relation with Plato Republic, but uh, anyway, it's a new society following strict communist principles, and they all live in Mars. And apparently in Mars, they have a visitor, and they give a tour to the visitor in Mars, and they, they take the visitor to the museum, to a museum, a Martian museum. And the visitor is shocked, and he says, I didn't expect to have a museum in, uh, in a new society. This is a, rem a remnant of capitalism. This is very bourgeois. <laughs> and uh, the, um, the guy said to him, oh, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. It's not capitalist at all. It is an encyclopedic <laughs> museum. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they give him a tour about, so they have plays, all the pay they have uh, paintings on display and sculpture according to days, uh, geographic um, origin, just to teach the new Martians, the new utopian generations of uh, what the bourgeois used to be, how the new collection. In Mars. Then, yes, in Mars. Sounds good. And I, I see one hand up, and I think we're running a little long on time, so maybe we can open it for a few few questions. If that's okay. Uh, Mr. Liebeskind, perhaps you can answer for us why young Jewish men who were not allowed to draw human beings were attracted to architecture. That was a question that came up before, and I think... Why they were attracted to architecture? You're talking about Heidegger, Lissitzky, those people in Vitebsk, yes? Or today. Today. You. To you. <laughs> At that time, yeah? Me. Uh, you. Me and you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Most of us think of architecture as steel and concrete and building buildings. Uh, but if you really think about it, architecture is the basis, really, of the humanistic tradition. Whatever the technologies that have developed, the essence of what, what I would call the free mind, the liberal arts, is architecture. It's, it's free thinking, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, the, the stars, arts, yeah. tragedy, poetry, dance. That's, that's a, a mind that can, can think freely about the world. And I think, uh, to me, at least I can speak personally, uh, architecture combines mm -hmm. really against, very often against the technologized, bureaucratized thinking, which is kind of inevitable with the movement of society, that architecture is free to change directions of, for example, what we look at, how we think, what we, how we live. Uh, do we need the apartments that look like this? Do we need streets that look like this? Do we need houses that have those windows? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's actually a fundamental question. And when you ask me about the Jewish characteristic, just think about it. In the biblical text and in the Talmud, an inordinate percentage of those texts is dealing with architecture. 
Now, it's not the only architecture that can be drawn and visualized easily, although the Jesuits throughout history tried to reconstruct you know, the temple or the, the ark or, or, or the, the tabernacle. But incredible amount of the text is written about just building and, and what it means, but without forming a single image. You can't form an image, even though people have tried to do it, but I don't believe it's possible. Uh, so it goes back to the root of time, you know, the tabernacle in the desert, building something in the desert, for example, as the beginning of a people around an idea. It, it's kind of fascinating that, that that thought of being together and being able to express to, togetherness with a text, but actually being in a physical space requires some sort of organization, mm -hmm. some sort of a trajectory. And before even, sort of even before even text, oh, the, the fact that orally you had to gather in order to hear to somebody hear. talk to you, right? Like the, what does it mean that sense yeah. of communion, right? It's all still related. Yeah, even I mean to the politics. column, the column of smoke and fire yeah. that that was constructed in the desert. What, what an amazing idea. It's, it's, it's close to Heidegger. It's close to the suprematists. It's the first you know, if you think about it, right? <laughs> first I mean, Gossamy. Yeah, mean. absolutely. So, and the cloud. And the cloud, yeah. So I, I don't really know exactly how to answer it, but th there's a deep connection there somehow. Uh, also, I think yeah. this 40 years was the 40 years of communism. Probably. And also maybe because uh, for so many millennia, Jews were not able to be architects. They were not you know, they were not able to be architects, simply. They were not able to practice in that profession. They were able to do other things, but not that. Maybe that came to fruition just at the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century, just opened up a whole new arena. Another question. You have this bright star in Vitebsk that's a very short life. And I'm wondering if you could say anything about places that are similar subsequent um, to that. And what comes to mind, if any of you know, um, that has this same sort of brightness, the Black Mountain College in North Carolina, yeah. all of two decades, yeah. and, and yet you'd think it was going on and on, um, and has similar kinds of um, um, multi-craft artistic points of view. And, and, and now that we have the, uh, so, so again, like getting lost in time by being unfair, like uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus, Mm -hmm. So we will be hearing a lot about it, right? And 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 then we will not hear so much about Butemas and all Even the parallel also things. Also, hundred years of Unovis will be <laughs> next just, year, yes. so and we also, will compete. And yeah. also, Novis had branches. Uh, it wasn't just in Vitebsk. The Vitebsk was the most successful example of this collective way of uh, endeavor, of thinking, of realization. But there were other branches in Smolensk, in Perm. Um, so it was an idea that was meant to be expanded as an experiment. And of course, it failed. Uh, but uh, that was the idea. Next year is going to be 100 years but, of uh, Vitebsk. But it, I, 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 why, why would it fail? I don't think it failed. I mean, it, it got stopped. But I don't think it fail. failed because a fail is like fail is like trying to walk and falling by yourself. Is somebody like trips you? It's an organization. So, yeah. Fail yeah. Organ yeah. No, a failure could be a state failure. Could be a failure of raise the funds or have the freedom. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that they fail to uh, to, to organize achieve. themselves or to achieve a project, but uh, it was a historical. Uh, Coincidence, a yeah. historical moment where, where this <laughs> uh, this experiment yeah. did not did not hasn't didn't re, they didn't realize this experiment in other places mm. uh, as as they meant to or as they were planning to and then they moved to St Petersburg um, and they most of the and they they remained together until 1920. But, but the fact that they're so influential today means that yeah, they, they didn't won, fail. Historically, yeah. They, I think they're still time. winning. Yeah, they were interrupted. But to definitely. go back to the question, there were many branches. Next year is going to be uh, a, a numerous celebrate events yeah. related to Bauhaus, a few events related yeah. to, unfortunately, Unfairly. to Lovis. Uh, and of course, not to forget other schools like Futemas yes. or Ginghuk. Where, where women were allowed to to do everything. In Vitebsk as well. Yeah. As, yeah. Opposed, as, as opposed as the there. Bauhaus and the yeah. ones that are mostly known, Bauhaus, mostly very radical male, at yeah. the moment too. Yeah, that's a good point. 
but also Bauhaus was about design and uh, Vitebsk uh, Unovis was about uh, all everything art. philosophy actually about everything. everything yeah and f it was well, art philosophy and science uh, all together I, I think yeah. that's the power of Vitebsk that it did not draw a line between art and architecture mm -hmm. and, and Bauhaus did Bauhaus made it clear yeah. that architecture is for the people who are more boring yeah. Yeah. who are going to do the more boring things they're going to work with materials they're going to follow the laws and the artists were you know Kandinsky and yeah. Fine and Jen, you know, free. free. but uh, that's I think that the genius of Vitebs that that they could see that there was no such line that was just a false line uh, even more architecture was a product of the f uh, art That's of, right. of suprematism exactly and Lazar Hidekel he was responsible for transforming 2D to 3D, Into 3D yes. to the uh, architectural volume yes. uh, and uh, he continued to this work in uh, Petrograd with Malevich and finally he created the first uh, suprematist architectural pro project and Lazar Hidekel also always said that the first is, of course, image, like obras. You, you go from obras, from image, and after you find your function, mm -hmm. not the way around. Because he said that contemporary architecture was born out of paintings. Paintings were more progressive at the time but than, even your than do architecture. Your, your drawings, they're so important to all of us, right? Thank you. Uh, but do, does he have the same relationship between like, the more free form of architectural manifestation to the building part? Well, I never, you know, I, I was a musician uh, in my former lifetime. And, you know, music is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, music notation, let, let's say you take a Beethoven symphony and you don't know what a score is, you open it. What do you see? You see lines, you see dots, mm -hmm. you see points, you see numbers, you see signs, you see a code. Uh, unless you're a musician, it's just a graphic piece, very similar to a master plan, where there's a lot of lines, a lot of points and numbers and all sorts of things. It looks like nothing unless you understand that the code can be opened and given mm -hmm. to workers who can implement it and in, uh, implement it in space, just like the music might have been written by somebody who's deaf, like Beethoven, who never heard it performed and be performed by a 120-person orchestra. That's the kind of wonder of of what a human being can do from so something so seemingly primitive, uh, li like a drawing or a, or a score, and how you can build a city or a orchestra or a music mm -hmm. out of something that mm -hmm. appears to be so abstract mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have the key yeah. into it and you're not... That's an excellent point because that was part of a discussion also at the Univis group. Uh, the the exploration of new textures, the textures of the future, mm. the futurology in materials mm. and techniques, in relation to uh, to science and music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So symbols <laughs> that can be uh, translated and transform into new textures, the textures visible or invisible, seen mm. or unseen, existing or non-existing. But something which is not existing doesn't mean that it's not it's going not to real, exist yeah, in the future. Yeah. Uh, so again, again, in the borderline of utopianism of the time, but in relation to, to, to music, mm -hmm. the texture, and it was part of the, of the writings of the, of the period, uh, to, to discuss the texture of a music score which is not necessarily what you see printed on a piece mm -hmm. of paper, but the texture that you can project as if you were listening what it was written, or, uh, as if you are listening the performed <laughs> music score. <laughs> so very complicated way of thinking, but it worked perfectly well with this amazing group of, uh, of students, and they all had to invent and describe the textures of the future. And they, they were present them in their diaries with symbols. And then next to the symbols, they were trying to verbalize. It's a new this, language uh, for a new society. Exactly, to okay. verbalize this new visual mm -hmm. and or acoustic textures. And that was unique. And also another point I was thinking when you, you were saying before about about the beauty of all these uh, new drawings and, uh, and the realization of drawings, the relation of, uh, of, that, of works of that period with a broader discussion about pangeometry, mm. new geometry, and the fourth dimension. So at that time, the fourth dimension wasn't considered as the time, 
but as part of a new geometric system, a new geometry, non-Euclidean geometry, non -Euclidean. that could, could uh, that we all could examine the world uh, not in uh, this three-dimensional system that we all agree and we all live to it, but as a new uh, in a new system like a fourth dimension, a fifth dimension, mm. and um, n-dimensional mm. space. That's why they were they were exploring. Uh, or they were neglected perspective uh, in some of the drawings. Um, Which makes them beautiful and really unique too, because they're yes. kind of not correct necessarily. And that's why in some, some of the works you have this sense of free flying yeah. in the space. Uh, that it, it was again part of the broader philosophical and laboratory discussion of the period. Never symmetrical, yeah, drawings. Yes, exactly. So, so maybe that's a good place to wrap up our discussion here. Unless there's any last questions? No, I think. But thank you all so much for sharing and joining us this evening. Um, copies of Daniel Liebskin and uh, Dr. Kedekel's books are available for sale and signing. So uh, again, thank you. And thank you for uh, concluding the exhibition with this wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.